This is lecture 6.2 on genetics. It is the second genetics lecture where we'll be covering well-known genetic traits and disorders in humans. We'll be learning about polygenic traits. We will uh, go through an example of co-dominant inheritance using the ABO blood type. We will be using pedigrees to determine inheritance and we'll be explaining sex-linked inheritance um, specifically go covering color blindness as an X-linked inherited trait. So when we covered the very first uh, lecture on genetic inheritance, we were looking at Mendelian inheritance and that's also known as simple inheritance. With Mendelian inheritance, there are two phenotypes. You can have a dominant phenotype and a recessive phenotype. The dominant individual, well, an individual with a dominant phenotype could either have a homozygous dominant genotype, big B, big B, or they could have a heterozygote uh, phenotype, so big B, little b. So if you have a monohybrid cross with simple dominance, you would get a three to one phenotype ratio of the dominant phenotype to the recessive phenotype. But that's not the only type of dominance we have. Well, let's back up a little bit and talk about what dominance is. When you have two different alleles in a cell for the same gene, which one should you use? Should you use the big B allele or should you use the little B allele? Well, the answer to that question is it depends. Each gene has got its own relationship with how it's expressed. So for some genes in your body, they follow simple dominance patterns and other genes follow other patterns. So you can liken this to having two recipes for cake in your kitchen. You've got your mum's recipe for cake and you've got your dad's recipe for cake. Some kitchens will choose to only make one of those cakes. So they might only ever make the mum's cake. If you've got a mom's cake recipe and a dad's cake recipe, you only ever make the mum recipe. That would be simple dominance. For incomplete dominance, you have three phenotypes because what you do instead of having only the mum's copy made or only the dad's copy made, what you do is you have a little bit of each recipe being made. So you end up with three unique phenotypes. You have a dominant phenotype, you have a recessive phenotype, and then you get an intermediate phenotype that is a blend of those two because you are expressing the gene using the big B allele and you're expressing the gene with the little b allele, just a little bit. You're not fully expressing them, but you're expressing them to a small extent. Incomplete dominance is something that's more commonly found um, in examples in your textbook, at least, in terms of plant coloration. So you may find that you get a problem set where you're describing a snapdragon flower. Um, the one flower was red, the other flower was white. And then when they had offspring, all of those offspring ended up being pink. And then when you cross the pink offspring with the pink offspring, you end up with some red, some pink, and some white. That should be a telltale signal for incomplete dominance, where you've got three unique phenotypes. Codominance is a third style of dominance where both alleles are expressed simultaneously at high rates. And the example for codominance, which we'll get into in a little bit, is called that we'll be covering is the ABO blood typing in humans. So for humans, um, there's several different genes involved in making proteins that are expressed on the surface of red blood cells. These proteins are used for the body to identify self cells from non-self cells. 
and in the medical field uh, the typing for blood type is quite important for determining what type of blood you are eligible to receive if you need a blood transfusion. There are other proteins that are involved for uh, cells across the body in identifying self and non-self and we monitor those protein expressions when a person is going to go through an organ transplant to make sure that the organs match up. So if you're finding an organ donor, they have to match up the proteins that are expressed on the outside part of those cells. Now for blood type, there are two things about it that make it difficult for many students. The first thing is that instead of having only two potential alleles, there are actually three alleles. So being that humans are diploid, which means that at most you're going to have two different alleles, you have to choose two alleles from that set. The three alleles are called big IA, immunoglobin A, immunoglobin B, or little i. So any human is going to have a combination of two choices from that list of three. So you can have the following genotypes. You could get two copies of the big IA, the immunoglobin A. You could get one copy of immunoglobin A and one copy of immunoglobin B. You could get a copy of immunoglobin A and a copy of little i. You could get two copies of immunoglobin B. You could get immunoglobin B with little i or you could get two little i alleles. Now, the way in which this works is that immunoglobin A produces an antigen or protein called A, and it expresses that protein on the surface of the cell. So in this picture here, this red blood cell has got these little purple lollipops sticking out the side. Those are representing the A type proteins. If a person has got the immunoglobin B, they can produce the B protein and that is expressed as these little squares on the outside of the cell. If a person has got both immunoglobin A and immunoglobin B alleles, they can actually make both types of immunoglobin. They can make the A antigen and the B antigen. A person who has two copies of the little i allele makes nothing. They don't make any antigen on the surface of their red blood cells. The little i antigen is recessive to the immunoglobin A and the immunoglobin B. So when you have this heterozygous case of immunoglobin A with a little i allele, that means that you can produce the A antigen and your phenotype would be indistinguishable from somebody who was a homozygote for immunoglobin A. If you have a heterozygous for immunoglobin B, you're going to produce antigen B and you will look identical to an individual whose cells are expressing two copies. So the genotypes are quite specific. It can be heterozygous, so A, B, A, little i, B, little i, or you can be homozygous. So we've got big A, we've got immunoglobin A, immunoglobin A, we've got immunoglobin B, immunoglobin B, and little i, little i. Now what this results in are a number of different phenotypes or blood types. So when somebody asks you, what is your blood type? What they're asking is, what is your phenotype? So for example, I am blood type O positive. Now, when I said O positive, I was actually talking about two different gene types, and we're only talking about ABO, so it's better for me to say I'm O, I'm blood type O. What that means is I've got two copies of the little i allele, and the surface of my red blood cells have got no antigens. On the other hand, I've had students who are blood type A. So, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that at least on the surface of their red blood cells, they're producing the A antigen, 
However, you can't tell what their genotype is. You don't know if they are the heterozygous A or the homozygous A. You would have to either do a genotype test on them, or maybe you might get lucky if you have a look at their family tree and you could figure out um, if they are more likely to be homozygous or heterozygous. But the interesting thing here is that we have this phenotype, which is AB, and that is the hallmark of codominance because antigen A and antigen B are both being produced simultaneously. So co means together. So they're dominating together. Now, when it comes to blood type, you might have heard about how some blood types are really valuable for blood donations. And especially right now with coronavirus, blood donations are still very important to provide not just plasma, but full whole blood as well. So let's have a quick look at that. Well, if you are red blood type O, you don't have any antigens on the surface of your red blood cells. In your plasma, which is the clear liquid that those cells float in, you can have two types of antibodies floating in your plasma. You've got anti-A and anti-B. Now, what that means is if somebody who's got red blood cell, that is blood type O, and you put into their blood cells from someone who is blood type A, the anti-A antibodies will glue themselves onto the antigens that are being expressed on the surface of those red blood cells from the donor cells and the blood would clot it would form big clumps and the donor the o donor would die if you are somebody who is a b that means on the surface of your red blood cells, you've got both the A antigen and the B antigen, which means that you don't have any of the anti-A or anti-B antibodies in your plasma. What that means is that it doesn't matter who gives you red blood because you don't have those antibodies to stick onto any of the red blood cells. And so you can receive blood from anyone. So if you are lucky enough to have red blood cell type that is AB, you are a universal recipient. If you are blood type O, that means you can only receive blood type O blood. But what it also means is because your blood does not have any antigens on it, you can give blood to anybody. You can give it to an AB, well, they're the universal recipient, but you can also give it to somebody who's blood type B or blood type A. So blood type O is called the universal donor. Let me go back a couple of slides so I've got a bit of space. And what I wanted to show you is how to do a quick um, sketch of um, a Punnett square if you were trying to look at two people who are having offspring. So let's say, for instance, I'm going to have a kid, so I'm little I, little I. And let's say, for instance, I marry somebody. That's a really wonky Punnett square, I'm sorry. Um, let's say I'm going to marry someone who is blood type um, AB. Okay, so you write immunoglobin A and immunoglobin B, because that's the different sperm types. And so then you make the combination. So I can have a little, a big IA with my little I. I A with that little I, I can have blood type. I've got immunoglobin B with my little I, and I can do immunoglobin B with my little I. So if I was a blood type O person and I married someone who's blood type AB, my children would be 50% blood type A and 50% blood type B. So here's a fun one. If I'm blood type O, and my husband is blood type AB, and I have a baby who is blood type O, what does that tell you? 
it tells you that I've either had a sperm donor or I've had an extracurricular affair because the only way for somebody who's blood type O to have a child who's blood type O is to either have the partner be blood type O or the partner has to be one of these heterozygotes in order to be able to donate that little I allele along with one of my little I alleles. All right, let's go forward a little bit. Okay, now remember I said my blood type is blood type O negative. That negative part is referring to something called the rhesus factor. This is a different gene that contributes to blood typing. You can either be rhesus positive or rhesus negative, and I happen to be rhesus positive over here. Okay, now, whoops, let's go back a slide. Okay, before I had my daughter, I could not tell you if I was homozygous dominant for my rhesus positive genotype or if I was a heterozygote. However, now I can tell you that I'm a heterozygote because my husband happens to be rhesus negative, which he, that means that he's little d, little d. And my kid is also negative, which means that the only way for her to be negative if he's negative and I'm positive is that I must have been a heterozygote. So it's fairly straightforward to create those Punnett squares. So I did that here for myself. So this is me, the heterozygote, and this is my partner. And here are the options. So my kid had a one in four chance of being uh, rhesus negative. And, well, no, actually, look at that. I made a mistake in this picture. I'll have to update it. So it should have been a 50-50. That should be like the test cross. So we would have um, two of the offspring being rhesus positive and two of the offspring being rhesus negative. Now, as a public service, you should probably find out whether you're rhesus positive if you're, or you're rhesus negative. Um, because if you are a rhesus negative mother and you have a pregnancy, a rhesus positive fetus can exchange blood through the placenta and that can trigger the mother, the rhesus negative mother, to make anti-rhesus antibodies that can attack future Rh positive fetuses. Now there is um, a medical treatment available for this problem um, because if you have um, a, uh, a an attack from rhesus antibodies on your fetus it can kill it but there's a special treatment called rogam it's a set of injections that block those antibodies um, in the mother's blood so it can't attack any fetuses that happen to be rh positive so because i'm rh positive that wasn't something that i ever had to consider however my kid being Rh negative might have to consider that. And that's something that you might consider too. And it's one of the reasons why if you become pregnant, one of the first things a doctor will do is ask you uh, what blood type you have. All right, let's talk about polygenic inheritance. Many human traits, and in fact, many traits across the uh, um, whole swath of life, are polygenic. That means there are multiple genes that each contribute a little bit to a phenotype. Two really commonly uh, provided examples in biology are human skin color and human height. Both of them are determined by the additive effects of many genes working together. So for example, if you have two moderately toned humans who have children, um, what you'll find is if they have many children, most of their children will also be moderately toned, but you may find that some of their children are particularly dark, much darker than either parent, or you might find that some children are much lighter than either parent. And what that's got to do with is if there were multiple genes, imagine gene A, B, and C, 
And for each gene, you could be dominant or recessive. Now imagine that each parent was heterozygote, heterozygous for each one of those genes. All the possible combinations of children. So this is not a dihybrid cross. This is now a trihybrid cross. What you could find is a small number of children could inherit the dominant allele for all three genes from parent one and the dominant allele for all three genes from parent number two and thus have a maximum additive effect of skin pigment. Or you could likewise have children who inherit the recessive allele for each three of those genes from parent one and the recessive allele for each three of those genes from parent two and have uh, the minimum added effect. Height works the same way. If you have two tall parents, it's likely that your children will also be tall. If you have two medium parents, medium height parents, you may have some tall children and some short children. If you have very, very petite parents, it's likely that the children will also be quite petite. One way in which we evaluate genetics in humans is to use something called a pedigree analysis. It's very useful because you can trace uh, a trait from one generation to the next. It can allow you to determine if something is recessively inherited, dominantly inherited, or sex linked. The way in which we do this is we draw a picture of a family tree where males are represented by squares and females are represented by circles. An individual who is affected is um, shaded in completely, and an individual who carries a trait. Um, or is affected can be um, marked with a half shading. Generally, what we do is to represent a, a marriage and a mating is we put a horizontal line. The vertical lines indicate who um, descends from who. So in this case, we have a female and her male partner who have a daughter and then a son. This daughter had twins. One of those twins had the trait and one did not, and so on. So you could fairly easily construct a pedigree chart for your full siblings um, and your full relationships. It becomes difficult to do uh, pedigrees if your parents or yourself have multiple partners or children with multiple partners because then you've got half siblings and step siblings and things like that. So a pedigree chart, you typically start with full siblings and then you can start to add on and uh, look at other variations of your family. So let's cover a few traits um, that are commonly found in humans. We have uh, single gene traits that are autosomal dominant. So what that means is that um, the homozygous dominant individual has the disease or trait, a heterozygous individual has the disease or trait, and an individual who's homozygous recessive does not have that disease or trait. And two very commonly found examples are polydactyly, which is having extra digits, and achondroplasia. So those are both autosomal dominant disorders. Um, the way in which you can tell by looking at a family tree that you've got an autosomal dominant trait is that you find the trait in every single generation. So each row is going to have individuals with it. Notice that you have an approximately equal number of males and females being affected by that trait as well. Autosomal recessive disorders, on the other hand, um, the individuals who have the disease or trait are homozygous recessive individuals. An individual who's got at least one copy of the dominant allele does not have the trait. An individual who's heterozygous is called a carrier because they carry the trait, but they do not express the disease. Two commonly known examples of this are albinism, in which the um, melanin pigment is shut off. So you don't produce uh, the dark melanin found in uh, skin or hair. 
um, and cystic fibrosis, which is a membrane transport disorder um, where there is excess production of mucus in um, the digestive system and respiratory system. And with autosomal recessive disorders, as you can find it in some generations and it skips other generations. So this uh, table here summarizes some human disorders controlled by single genes. Um, and uh, these are autosomal disorders. So that means that the genes for these disorders are found on chromosomes number 1 through 22. Those are the autosomes. Disorders that occurred on sex chromosomes are inherited differently, and that's where we'll have to get into sex linkage in just a second. But um, what you'll notice here is the incidence of these disorders is quite variable, and some groups of, of people have higher rates of these disorders than others. Um, recessive disorders, albinism, cystic fibrosis, galactosemia, PKU, sickle cell disease, and Tay-Sachs. Now, what you'll notice is that in uh, certain groups of individuals, you have higher rates of things. So, for example, Tay-Sachs disease has a higher rate in uh, individuals from um, Ashkenazi Jewish heritage um, than people who are from Africa or Asia, for example. Dominant disorders include one of the types of Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, hypercholesteremia, which is high cholesterol, um, and you can have a look at the rates of those incidences. So sex determination in humans. We have discussed this before in one of our previous lectures, but we can recap it real quickly. So there are 22 pairs of chromosomes called autosomes, and both males and females have those. They are the genes of the body. One pair of chromosomes is called the sex chromosomes. Um, all humans have to have an X chromosome because it has some genes that are required for both males and females. The Y chromosome confers maleness, and um, men are XY, women are XX. And when I say men and women, I'm talking about chromosomal men and chromosomal women. Sex linked disorders are genetic disorders where a broken gene is on a sex chromosome. And what you would need to do is you'd need to make your planet square like this one, where you've got the female up on the top here. So here's egg number one with an X chromosome, and here's egg number two. And then the male can make sperm that have X sperm or Y sperm. As it turns out, males uh, determine the sex of their offspring. If your um, offspring is a female, it's because the male provided an X chromosome. And if your offspring is male, it's because they provided a Y uh, chromosome in the sperm. Colorblindness is a well-studied X-linked human disorder. X-linked means that the uh, broken gene is found on the X chromosome. So on this corner here, we have a couple of pictures um, showing what normal color vision uh, might look like versus one of the types of color blindness called green color blindness or deuteranopia. Now, with color blindness, we have got five possible genotypes. We have the normal female, so that is a female who has two copies of the um, gene, and both of those copies are normal. A female with color blindness is a female who, on each one of her X chromosomes, is um, carrying a broken copy of the color blindness uh, gene. There are females called carrier females, and this is a female who can see color, but she is carrying that recessive and broken allele. But she's got one copy that works, and so therefore she can see color. We have males who have color blindness and males who are normal. Males can't be carriers because they only have one X chromosome, and the X chromosome either has a copy that works or has a copy that doesn't work. So in this example below, we have a carrier female, so she's X big A and X little a, and she is partnered with a normal male, so he's X big A, Y. And out of the possible children that they could have, 
um, they could have a female who is normal, so she inherits the big A from mom and the big A from dad and is normal. You could have a carrier female, so she inherits her big A from her dad and she inherits the little A from her mom. She can see color, but she's a carrier, like her mother. And of the sons, you could have a son who is normal. He gets the big A from his mom and he gets the Y to make himself male from the father. And you also have a son who is colorblind. So he gets the little A from his mother and he gets the Y from his father. So when you're working on colorblindness Punnett squares, make sure you start out by making the Punnett squares with the X's and then you can superimpose the alleles onto the correct chromosomes.